<laughs> oh my God. I love talking with you about these like incredibly heavy matters because, you know, okay, we are alive. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, Daryl, when you, um, when you share the information that you do on these matters that are, to be honest, you know, overwhelming, terrifying, you know, literally life and death for a lot of people, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is reshaping the entire global view of the human race. And when you give your information, you have such a wonderful way of giving the roots to it so people can understand seemingly disparate elements, how they're connected and where they come from. So I just want to like give you an appreciation for that. Thank it's, you. Uh, I have had a lot of people um, of all different backgrounds. A lot of people since we started doing this uh, tell me that our conversations have helped them understand what's going on so they can make um, informed decisions of how they think and feel rather than just, you know, fear-based, automatic response, mindless, reactive decisions. So, you know, I, I'm starting our conversation today with gratitude to you for helping people be comfortable understanding and determining, you know, so how they think and feel. Thank you, I appreciate that. That means a lot. Um, and I'm not crying, so I'm sorry to let everybody know. Uh, my, I, I just started, my eye just started watering. <laughs> but trust me, I'm not crying. <laughs> Yeah, I always say tears are how you know you're resonating with truth, but there's also a lot of pollen out right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, and I will, I said I wasn't going to say this when we were on, but I will, but the people who really know me know, I don't usually wear a lot of makeup at all. So I think it's my face trying to get used to, I was not mm -hmm. used to makeup. So anyway, I'm human. <laughs> so, but thank you. And I know we're going to, it's going to be kind of, um, just a real conversation and we have something we want to cover, but I do want to circle back around to that concept of fear when it's time. So don't let me forget. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Note, do not forget about fear. Don't forget about fear. Right. <laughs> so um, for everyone who has joined us already and for all the people who will join us later, um, today's conversation is uh, what started when I called our wonderful Dr. Daryl Thorne. Um, this was like a month ago. It was like, a, yeah, it was like a week or so after George Floyd's murder when, um, when as soon as the American peace marchers, Black Lives Matter peace marchers started, and then immediately there was like riots and stuff. And then it was like very quickly proven that this was not the peace marchers. These were mostly like white yeah. insurgents and people like that coming in, trying to turn it into a riot. Um, and that was quelled. And then immediately Black Lives Matter marches started all over the world. And um, I was, I, I called Daryl and I said, you know, Dr. Daryl, what's going on? Why is an American Black Lives Matter movement that the U.S. government is trying so hard to squash? Why is it supported and or emulated immediately all over the world? And you I said... said. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't remember how I said what I said, but do you want to share how you understood what I said? Well, you said you wanted to do some research and get that you had thoughts, but you wanted to do some research so you could give me an informed answer. And um, since that time, the headlines have shown us much of the answer, but you read this amazing book. Um, actually, can you hold it up so that people can see the title? Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Right. 
So I'll jump in real quick. So yeah, there are things that I know, not just because I know them. Um, for me, it feels like it's a matter of common sense, things that I've kind of strewn together um, as early as I can remember, right? But then there are other things and pieces of it that are supported by the stories, meaning history or stories across the world that aren't readily widespread because of the nature of white supremacy. And so the readings that I engage in, actually just because I love to engage in these types of readings are really grounded in truth and they support what I inherently know and understand, but it does give me language to help to articulate it. And so that is that people who have not been, um, again, blessed with their idea of whatever whiteness is. And remember when I say whiteness and white supremacy, I'm talking about the folks who cast themselves or are casted as whatever the majority in that country is. And so these are usually people who are not indigenous to whatever these lands are, the countries in the world, um, they are marked with some form of whiteness, which can also be translated into colorism. And then they felt that they have been given divine right, because a lot of this does go back to divinity and religion concepts and religion is also a social construct, but this divine right or essence to then conquer those people in those lands. And so that process, whether you want to call it colonization, I hate the word settlers. I'm going to be honest with you. That is so racist because they're not settlers. <laughs> they were terrorists, right? Yeah. They didn't settle well, these lands. If people are living on a land and this was already settled. settled. Right. 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 So that's the common sense thing. So again, so all across time in history, the, the actual barbarians and people who say that they've civilized areas were actually the, the, the barbarians and the conquerors. And that has happened all across the world, right? Mm -hmm. Even if there are people who the way we want to limit the complexity of humanity, they wanna say that these people look like me, there are still, there are still differences, right? The whole idea of Western Europeans conquering and enslaving Eastern Europeans way back, right? In what is it, the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries and all of those, well, to us, phenotypically, you know, they're all white people. That's what we would call mm -hmm. them. People. But they weren't. They were different groupings. So it was still this matter of um, uh, conquering groups of people. But because of that history all across the world and then enter the enslavement of, it, there were white people. Eastern Europeans were, were slaves. A lot of people don't seem to know mm -hmm. they were enslaved by Western Europeans. But enter the imagery of Africans being enslaved and black bodies being the representation of enslaved people by who we now consider to be white people. You, you enter that into the picture and then substitute depending upon where you are, Aboriginal or indigenous people for that black body, still non-white bodies into that same narrative you then have what we have now. You have groups of people who have been um, oppressed, who have been objectified, who have been enslaved or minimized by these terrorist groups, the original terrorist groups that call themselves colonizers or civilized folks. And now you have this, I'm going to say, uprising on purpose because there's this commonality of history of saying we've been affected just like these people who have been called and labeled whatever black is, whatever African-American is by the colonizers. There is this unity of experience in our own lands. You know, so, so that part I, I understood implicitly. Um, there was a, I think I mentioned this before and I should have researched his name, but that there was a gentleman, um, I want to say in Australia, who was uh, Aboriginal and he suffered the same fate that George Floyd did like a year before um, and used the, um, the I can't breathe, right? Um, 
and it was the same standing on the neck, uh, the, very similar, but he was indigenous. Of course, we didn't hear about it here because that happened in Australia, but when um, oh, yeah. the Black Lives Matter movement began around George Floyd, and again, I have to emphasize the people who still don't get it, it's not about George Floyd's death. It's about all of the, the historic atrocities mm -hmm across the world and across this country that were part of this country where black and brown bodies were brutally murdered at the hands of white supremacy. That's what it's about. And now finally, people across the world are saying, yeah, we've been affected too. This isn't just isolated and we're all banded together. And yeah, the pandemic I think has been helpful in it just because worldwide people have been quarantined and locked onto their social or locked into their social media more readily, but that is really how it has spread and why it has taken off. Um, I will offer this too. I was um, approached, <clears throat> I won't mention the individual's name. Um, he has his own program and he very much is an activist, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of indigenous matters and, and, and wants to uplift the indigenous, meaning Native American indigenous communities in our country. But the idea of uh, Native and indigenous lives matter is absolutely true. But what I won't say is that just like with Blue Lives Matter and All Lives Matter, I'm not going to say that it is separate. I'm not right. that. There are like issues and it really depends on where you are in terms of what's highlighted there is so much as, as as many people know i have i descend from indigenous ancestry but i didn't grow up within the the culture and that is directly mm -hmm. and that's a whole nother story can i actually i need to interject here yeah. because what you just said this is really relevant. Um, there are people trying to separate out Native Lives Matter mm -hmm. with Black Lives Matter, and there are people who are trying to separate out North American, Central American, and South American as separate races, basically, mm -hmm. whereas North, Central, and South are all Indigenous Americans and had an amazing, you know, like, two continents worth of civilization before, as you said, the barbarians came and enslaved them and murdered them. But um, I do need to touch on a comment that we've gotten, which is uh, the several times ago, you mentioned that you are both indigenous American mm -hmm. and African American. And there are two things I have to mention on that. One was, and this is where I'm going a little more to my woo side. Mm -hmm. I was doing a past life reading for someone several years ago. And in that, the past life, one past life that came forward was a woman who was a runaway slave, managed to make her way, um, stow away on a ship and made her way all the way up to like Boston or then on foot, she went all the way up to Maine. Mm -hmm. where she was um, met with uh, the Native Americans and became one of their tribe. And um, this was a, it's, it was like a revelation for this woman that mm -hmm. someone who was African American and people were Native American would integrate. But it was a very detailed life. Like we were able to document mm -hmm. it with details Right. Dates, names, towns, like all the stuff that came out, we documented. And um, as I said, it was a revelation for this woman who, uh, I don't even remember who the client was. I just remember it was a revelation. Right. And then a little while later, I was in New York and there is a mural uh, a tribute to Native Americans and was on the side of a building, the entire side of the building painted with this beautiful mural. And in it, they had people who were obviously African-American and African-American, Native American mixed with the Native Americans. And um, I was told that at the recent election of when I was there, mm -hmm. um, 
there was a very conservative, like Trump loving kind of woman running for, I forget what city council, you know, whatever local position. And she lambasted the murals saying Native Americans and African Americans had no place together, you know, and like just lambasted this. And um, then it was found out that, you know, she was like a Nazi racist KKK kind of person. So, you know, she didn't win the race. And um, because of her lambasting it, all this town brought up all the history of the Native American tribes there becoming haven for runaway slaves and absorbing them into their culture. Mm -hmm. So um, that started me in a deep dive of research on what kind of people will create haven for what kind of people at times of need right. and how that creates um, mutually mutual evolution among cultures. Yeah. Um, and so when you mentioned the other month that you're both indigenous American and African American, I thought that was amazing. But we received a lot of, I think unintentionally highly racist remarks. People saying they no longer considered you an expert on African American studies with that one comment, because since you're only half African American, can you really understand? <laughs> no. And this is, I gotta say, this was all white people. This was all white people suddenly saying, once they see you as not completely African American, even though you have your doctorate and you're a college professor, and you know, like you, aside from your personal heritage, you're already an expert. So I, I'd like to address this because I think there's a lot of people who need to have things shuffled in their minds about Native yeah, No, I wanted to. Yeah, thank you. And first, I don't identify, so let me say this and let me, let me clearly articulate this for everybody listening. I don't care how you are positioning yourself. I need you to understand what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. Because if you interpret it through your own lens, that's your interpretation. First of all, African-Americans, that term was made up. You got Africans and you got people who collectively are whatever America was. The first peoples of this land are who we think of as really naturally Native Americans. Every single tribe and group of people had their own language, own customs, and they really identify as their group, whether it's Cherokee, Chippewa, um, Ojibwe, and there are so many other groups of indigenous people that were killed off, that were smaller bands or tribes of people. So that's one. I have been ascribed, as I've said, whatever blackness is, I prefer that over mm -hmm. African American because I understand the colonization of it and I'm, I'm not having that. My indigenous ancestry cannot be disputed. I go prove to me that I'm not, but I am because my DNA says that. I didn't do the DNA the ancestry, but I have the oral history. I have the ancestors who lived, who I communed with, who actually their parents were tribal members and went, but we weren't to, to you know, to um, the various ceremonies and told them about it, but it wasn't safe during that time. And I'm talking about like the 1930s, 40s. And in Virginia, it wasn't safe to be considered no. indigenous. At all, it was actually safer to be considered black or, or African American because yeah. it was recognized. You know, they tried to write all of the Virginia Indians out of history. So yeah. I need people to understand that I know my damn history. I know my family's history. You don't know that. And I also do know the history of Virginia and the history of this country. So you have to always challenge by whom and for what purpose and the narratives. Mm -hmm. that said, I can also go back and challenge all of the people who claim their whiteness. There's no such thing as purity. So if you buy into that, you're buying into this idea of eugenics and paper genocide, right? Mm -hmm. The reality of my family is that we have members um, who represent all of the socially constructed racial groups. I just never check off white. Not, not for obvious reasons that you would think of, but I refuse to give more power to that, right? 
ancestrally, yeah, I do have ancestors who would be considered white that weren't that far back. Right. I'm in the, the camp of my indigenous and my, my air quote black ancestors. And just to be clear, my relatives who are positioned as whatever black is, Benita, are the same color as you. Mm -hmm. So people who don't understand, especially white folks who don't understand blackness, there's no such thing as purity of anybody unless you're straight out of Africa and you can really trace that lineage. And even then it might be some questions. Actually, we, we have um, Black members in my family. And I was shocked when I did the 23andMe and learned I did not have any African ancestry, but I have a lot of the Jewish ancestry on my mother's side. Right. But yeah, I, I have, I have we, we have Black families with my same name and everything. Yeah, so there, the history, you have, to, you have to understand and embrace all of the raping, the pillaging, mm -hmm enslavement of this country to understand. The other thing with the indigenous communities, you have to also understand that, that bef even before the idea of, of the tribes giving safe haven to runaway enslaved Africans or people, that one tribe could be at war with another tribe. Mm -hmm. Very few would kill just to kill. That's not even the indigenous way. But their form of captivity would allow for somebody who was of another tribe to be absorbed into that current tribe. So you have people who were adopted and brought into the tribe that weren't necessarily originally from that because it is part of a cultural thing. A lot of people don't understand that because Native American, if you will, history and culture has never been thoroughly part of the narrative of America, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not appropriately covered in any textbook or history book. So most people don't even understand that. So to write off and say, this person is not indigenous because of their phenotype or because they have ancestors who may have originated from what we think of as Africa is erroneous. Because here's the other thing that a lot of people don't know that all of the, not all, but many of these indigenous tribes bought into racism, white supremacy. And so white folks really, inter years back, entered into the tribes really to take over the land. And then they had relationships with the indigenous community. And so when all of the legislation that was very explicitly racist in the 1800s and early 1900s said, hey, we are not going to support you with any government funding if you continue to have anybody of African ancestry into your tribe. So they were forced to literally kick out their tribal members. And these are tribal members who were full tribal members. I did not know this. this I know a lot horrible. of people don't know. So it, it, does, it pisses me off when people talk and they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Yeah. A lot of tribes in the, in the five civilized tribes were the most guilty of this. They were considered civilized because they bought into the white man's view, whether or not they want to they have or not. You go back through the history books where they say, oh, you know, now, you know, the Cherokee freedmen, they were Cherokee. Um, I think the, was it the Chippewa? Any of the, the civilized behind that means that they bought into the white man's rules. Right. Whether or not they want to acknowledge that or not, right? The fact yeah. that you have a card to prove tells you it is made up, it is constructed. Mm -hmm. Nobody else has to have a card to prove that they are a member of any type of ethnic group or cultural group. It is because you are, right? Yeah. Part of it because you are. But yeah, so racism has hit indigenous communities. This idea of anti-Black sentiment has hit every single community because it was constructed to further the goals of the government, which was designed based upon white supremacy. Mm -hmm. So you have to challenge all of it. So there's no such thing as purity. Indigenous right. communities have adopted people in throughout their time. That's how you survive, the strength uh -huh. in numbers. Strength in numbers. Yeah. 
And there have been a lot of articles written by other scholars who are, are indigenous scholars um, that have talked about the whitening of tribes. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly why. And this comes into, uh, as you were saying, white currency. You know, and when I was a child, and there are things that I would love to never, ever repeat because they're not things that my family took part in, but they were here in Virginia surrounding us. So there was common language that my family taught us not to buy into, but we were surrounded by it. And I would love to just bury it, but then, you know, we're ostriching. When I was growing up around here, we were taught that there were good Indians and bad Indians. And, you know, just as you were saying, the ones that bought into the white currency and, you know, played along for what they considered their best chance of survival under the white oppressors, which meant kicking out members of their family, of their community, because they had black in them. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can get much more white currency than that. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because the people like Jefferson and all these other folks way back and then moving forward positioned Indigenous people against Black people when it, when they, because you need to also understand that Indigenous people were the first folks who were, they tried to enslave here. But of course, because it was their land, they knew, knew how to escape. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you bring other groups of people over that don't know the land, it's easier to oppress them and contain them. Yes. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting concept because you're trying to position two groups of historically oppressed people and the indigenous groups have been oppressed longer on this land. Folks don't want to recognize that. So I have to advocate for that. You don't hear about what goes on in court. As far as I'm concerned, all of this is Indian country, but, but what people consider to be Indian country more in the Midwest, you know, um, they don't, you have no idea the statistical rates of indigenous women who are raped and murdered and killed. Oh, yeah. We don't hear about that here. So yeah. indigenous and Indian lives, Native American lives do matter. Absolutely. And I will never say that they don't because again, I do identify with my ancestry, but I'm under this caption. I've lived whatever is considered the black experience, right? Mm -hmm. They all absolutely matter. The reason why the Black Lives Matter uh, movement is so relevant across the world is that it encompasses everybody's life walk that has been horribly oppressed, victimized, uh, positioned as less than, and we don't hear about. Mm -hmm. Really think depending upon where you live, whatever group has been experiencing these explicit forms of murder, of um, inequities in terms of the wealth gap, just self-worth, life valuing, you know, less than say whoever is considered the majority, Wherever you are in the world or in the country, the Black Lives Matter movement is your moniker. You can substitute whatever term you want. The thing is you have to understand in the psyche not to allow the status quo to pull apart the movement. People have got to stop lowering everything down to the least common denominator in their minds and focusing on that. If you do that, that goes back to the fear I wanted to cover. You are absolutely operating in fear and you're missing the damn point of the whole thing. There were so many articles. So let me finish real quick. I know I'm running, out, but let me finish where I was going before. So the gentleman asked me if I would be on his show to talk about Native Lives Matter and how Black Lives Matter is not, um, uh, does not focus on Native Lives Matter. And it's, and so I said, you know what, I got to, I don't necessarily see it that way. I got to disagree. And so consequently, I haven't been on the show. I don't know if I'm going to be or not. I don't know. But I'll tell you why. And it's exactly where I'm going with this, is that late, ne, Black Lives Matter has never said nobody else's lives matter. Right. You've got to understand that 
in this country, indigenous lives and black lives have been the least common denominator all along, all along. And any movement that has gotten traction in this country has started from the black diaspora. Oh, the other thing I have to correct is I've never said I was the expert on African-American, all things African-American studies. That is not my, so I just wanna correct that. I, I live as a black woman, but I am very interdisciplinary. So understand that. Um, but understanding too, that that black lives matter encompasses every oppressed group. Indigenous, the indigenous movement, the indigenous folks have been fighting since this land was raped, pillaged and taken over. We didn't have social media then you know, the, the, the indigenous language, you know, there was, there were issues there. Thankfully the Cherokee had their syllabary and all of that, but there was nothing in the mainstream to tell everybody about all of the resistance movements that happened. So again, you have to pay attention to where the narratives are coming from. With the black experience because of enslavement, because of whatever the myths were that people buy into about the Civil War not being about sla a slavery, and it absolutely was because slavery was a was capitalism. But because of that mass movement, there has been much more in the books about slave resistance, and not even adequately described up until now. Now we're we're, we're really seeing the 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 essence. And in and, and, and the links of all of the different resistant movements. And like I've said before, I don't know if it was through this medium or, or wherever, um, there are so many smaller things that happen. Everyday people make decisions and engage actively in resistance. We just don't always hear about it. So all of the little things that we're seeing that have led up to this moment didn't just start because of Black Lives Matter, the movement. Right? Black Lives Matter movement didn't create this. All of these things, these little fires, if you will, have started internally with different people who have come together collectively. So the, the movement is just now the face of it. It's showing up. It's like this thread that ties us together to say we are all fighting for and advocating and standing up to these oppressive powers that now we can finally provide voice to, which is white supremacy. And the people it benefits don't like, they, the most, they don't like it. Right. So they're stepping into their fear. And there's yeah. one thing, I wasn't, going, I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but from the book, I got to find it. There was one thing she said that resonated with me. Um, well, there were a lot of things she said that resonated with me <laughs> but she talked about I don't know if I can find it but quickly she I gotta say I didn't read the book but I did some research on yeah. uh Rennie at a lodge and I read reviews on the book and excerpts it is she is amazing she is amazing she, I put just amazing yeah so she talked about basically the fear of um I forget I don't know if I can find it I'm kind of in here but I can't find it but basically the fear of um black the black power black humanity mm -hmm. and that is what what folks are afraid of whether you are in the camp of um position yourself as white and you're fragile with your whiteness and you or you don't claim the racism of the whiteness thing or if you are not you're in a camp of being non-white but you're afraid to speak up about you know confronting white supremacy she's saying that that is what people are afraid of. They are afraid of black humanity. Because yeah. they're thinking we're gonna lose out. And that's not the case. And the Black Lives Matter movement is all about uplifting humanity, but you gotta start with what you're afraid of. And for whatever reason, people are afraid of the black body, the black imagery, the indigenous body, the indigenous imagery. And it is the same movement. Let's not get lost in semantics. You know, this is, um. I don't remember if I mentioned it when you and I were talking privately or on one of the live streams. So forgive me if I'm repetitive, but um, it's something that uh, a young, a, a teenager said to me that I thought was brilliant, which is humanity, 
like homo sapiens are by their nature um, abusive bullies. That once upon a time we had Neanderthals and homo sapiens and the Neanderthals, yeah. right, they were actually superior in many ways. They, they had a superior civilization. They were bigger, they were stronger, they were smarter, they were more innovative, but the homo sapiens were better at, I think, throwing spears, throwing rocks. And the homo sapiens had to enslave and then kill the Neanderthals because the homo sapiens did not want to compete with them. Although, um, uh, uh, paleontologists and archaeologists looking at it do not believe the Neanderthals were a violent race, but the Homo sapiens were. Mm. So the Homo sapiens have a history of wanting to dominate everything bigger, stronger, and better. When you look at us, we're puny. And as, was, as this person said to me, a cow is bigger and better than a human. A cow can survive on its own outdoors with zero resources. It has the ability to find food it needs to eat, wander into shelter, eat water. If mm -hmm. you put a cow out in the wild with some other cows, it, they will find a way for the most part to survive. You know, if a cow falls on a human, the human is squashed. Yeah. And the human, we cannot survive on our own with, you know, zero anything. The first thing we have to do is make survival weapons, clothing, shelter, or we will perish within a rap, you know, within a short period of time. So what do we do? We put cows in a box. We tell them what and when they can eat. We tell them how they live. We even put them in these boxes in structures where the air is dirty and they never get to see the sun or the sky or walk on grass for their entire lives. Also, we can have like cheeseburgers and milkshakes. You know, we as homo sapiens have a desire, and I'm talking a collective we, every individual person's like, oh, not me, I'm speaking collectively as a race. Historically, it has been the bullies who have risen to the top and the most uh, capable, competent, strongest brilliant ones are at the bottom so it's like a pyramid and he said if you look to the top of the pyramid whoever it is who is like claiming that they're the very very best they're the top they get to dictate to everyone else in our country we see a small pool of mostly white men who are dictating birth control for women who are dictating how anyone can live who are saying we should not increase minimum wage or those lazy people won't work hard enough like the whole concept of slavery obviously has never gone away it's just been re-regulated to benefit this tiny peak yeah. at the top of mostly white men who just want everyone else to be under their control and at the bottom, what are we going to find? Indigenous and Black, in our country, Indigenous and Black Americans, uh, refugees and immigrants. Yeah. And because of the white currency, the ones who are white, it's easier for them to rise up and blend in. Mm -hmm. But the best way for them to do that is by becoming bullies because they see that's what's at the top of the power structure. Yeah, and that's there, that's that's world systems theory as well. You know, um, where there's this this idea <clears throat> that there are two camps. There are the uh, people who have bountiful resources and the folks who take the resources and capital. And so historically, what we call poor, I hate the term third world. I hate, I don't like even people from those areas call this. It doesn't even make sense anymore. It, it, it really doesn't, it, but anyway, um, but those countries that are not as financially wealthy, uh, but they have all of the resources that we need, the food, you know, um, the, the human capacity, they are so oppressed worldwide. And there are not just the United States, but other countries 
that we would consider westernized who are then the smaller in your in your pyramid they're at the top and they are demanding that these other countries provide what we need the resources and continuing you know telling them to continue to work and then they're withholding the our countries are withholding the financial resources, the whatever it is that these other countries need that can make their lives better and easier, mm -hmm. holding them hostage, if you will. It's the same slave mentality, oppressor, oppressed mentality, and it's world systems theory. That is also what unites this particular movement, you know, because there are people who represent all of these different hierarchies in all of these, these countries. So yeah, pretty relevant. Yeah. And, you know, um, thinking about your white currency, or not your, the white currency. I was like, I don't, uh, I don't think I have no, that. You don't own it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, don't, just, that I don't have. Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> yeah, you do. You I do, do I do. Um, and I'm sorry to tell you, it didn't get me very far. So good luck to you. Um, no, but I actually, in looking at this, uh, when we were talking about brown people, Brown Lives Matter situation, I did a little test. I called randomly a bunch of people I know, and I gave them the same question. I'm thinking of hiring an assistant to help me because I'm having trouble with like website and this, this, and that. Um, and it sounded two people. I got someone in who's from Bolivia that I've been working with, and I have someone from India. Every single person. Some people said, uh, maybe you should look a little more. No one asked me about the qualifications of these two people, but every person said you should hire the person from India. Every single person. I called close to 15 people and it was a random phone call, some minor conversation. I made sure both people sounded equally qualified it's shocking how many people didn't even ask about qualifications. They said, yeah, well, because India is considered technology. You call tech support, you get someone in India. So that, so there's, I was like, this sounds to me like white currency mm -hmm. because, you know, just because someone's from India does not mean they're more tech savvy than someone from Bolivia. You know, I know people from Bolivia who have PhDs. You know, the, yeah. There's so a whole model, model minority. It's that myth too that a lot of Asians and South Asians mm -hmm. are are are, are um, trapped into with stereotyping. You know, there's yeah. no such thing. There's yeah, no such thing. So when we talk about the Black Lives Matter, and you made that wonderful statement that there's the white people have already claimed white lives matter. They're like, you can't debate this. We're white and we're at the pinnacle of the pyramid. We get to claim it. When you say Black Lives Matter and Blacks at the bottom, then you're saying all lives in between, all shades matter automatically with this statement. And I'm Which, throwing the indigenous group for clarity. I'm throwing the indigenous groups in that, whether folks agree with it or not, I don't really give a damn who agrees with me or doesn't. But it, it is, there's always been a historical connection with indigenous folks in general and black folks in general because of what you talked about during the enslavement, there was that common survival. And it wasn't until um, there was clear racist policy that was written down in policy within the United States as it was trying to develop that then challenged those connections. So I wanna make it clear. Yeah, now we have two comments here. The first one says, I think people who are saying that Black Lives Matter is only for Black people are working to destroy the movement. Mm -hmm. The goal is to create and maintain division amongst oppressed people. You know, for people yeah. who are saying, we can accomplish more together and the white people who want to maintain their privilege and currency know this. So it is in their interest to create division and bully those who want to change. Absolutely. And that's where I was going with it, that we got yeah. together. It is about, here's the thing. I was thinking about this the other day, or maybe it was yesterday. I don't know. My space-time continuum is all good. 
Here, we, if you are living your life, and I'm going to place a whole lot of judgment, but I'm going to be accountable, but I'm going to say it, and I'm going to mean it with all my heart. If you have been living your individual lives with any ounce of, any ounce of integrity, any ounce of integrity, you should be an ally to someone who hasn't lived your particular experience. We all should be an ally to someone. Read me correctly, read, understand it correctly. We all should be an ally to someone, which means in terms of being human, we are all responsible for the equity of the other because we are all the other and we are all allies to someone. So framed that way, just like the, the whoever um, commented, which is the same thing I was trying to say, the Black Lives Matter movement is for everybody who's ever, 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 ever been historically oppressed. Overwhelmingly, it is people who have been identified as whatever Black is. And if you are Indigenous, yes, absolutely. If you are, and especially if you are Indigenous and look Indigenous, because there are a lot of Indigenous people who look white, y'all. It's their ancestry, and they are not fully indigenous if you want to technically do the DNA thing, but that's not what I'm necessarily a proponent of. So you have to understand that there's a lot of trickery going on. We have to, we have to know and see divisionary tactics where we are. If nothing else, the one thing that I can say, hopefully y'all can, can go with me with this, ride with me. The one thing that I think to our benefit, we have learned from the Trump administration is that we should be able to clearly see trickery coming around the corner before it hits us. We, we got to be able to see that. And so anything that smacks of being divisionary to humanity, that's what it is. And we have to make sure that we clearly see it and we guard against it. We recognize it for what it is. So thank you. I want to say caller. <laughs> 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 for, for articulating that just clearly, because that's exactly what it is. And we have another comment here. Dr. Darrell, I was thinking of this, and it is so true. Those who identify with whiteness and those who align to the whiteness are so scared of losing the illusion of their worth due to uh, the young patriots. Wait, no, sorry. Someone did another comment and I jumped. Um, are so scared of losing the illusion of their worth due to the whiteness. They have only defined their worth in relations to others. It is the greatest ego. It is the greatest ego death. And we have one more comment I want to read. For example, like Fred Hampton, Black Panther, he started to collaborate with the young Lord in New York City, Puerto Ricans, and the Young Patriots to fight the system. He was killed for this. Black Panthers documentary by PBS. Mm -hmm. Hampton was making strides and J. Edgar Hoover was scared. Yeah, yeah. thank you, because I love the Black Panther. I, I would yeah. believe myself to be a Panther in spirit. I'm a late 60s baby. So anyway, and that's the other thing. Again, I always say challenge by whom, for what purpose, because people who are still under the auspices that the Black Panthers were, uh, a terrorist organization. No, that yeah. is Hoover and his white media wanted to portray because they were trying to instill fear. The fact is a lot of the human services that we have now are a result from the, the Black Panthers 10 point platform, like free lunch for children, um, you know, before and after care and the free lunch piece and some other things um, are what the Panthers stood for. And the arming themselves was because that is one of the amendment rights that people who want to own guns are always proposing. But the thing is, if, if, if you, you meaning the white society, institutional races, if you are going to hold a gun against me, I have the right to hold a gun against you to protect myself. So you also have to watch media is never unbiased, y'all. I don't care. Yeah. I can tell you that media is not unbiased. So you always have to challenge everything. So thank you. I'm still going to say caller because I just like the way it sounds. Thank you, caller, for, for <laughs> sharing. Right. And I do recommend to everyone go and do some research on the Black Panthers because 
the majority of people in the United States, what you were raised hearing and thinking about them is like really incorrect. The opposite. Yeah. The opposite. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at this, like you were saying, the Black Lives Movement encompasses all oppressed people. You know, as we were talking the, about the other day, Daryl, the women's movement was started with a lot of powerful, brilliant black women were really involved in the early stage of, of uh, women's lib movement in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I was gonna say which era because when yeah. <laughs> it was white women. So I always wanna make that clear. It's like, yeah, no, but that time period, yes. <laughs> yeah, and then written out of history written out so that it was all white women and middle-class white women claiming their power mm -hmm. and actually my mom and i are going to talk some about that um in my next uh voices of freedom because she was one of the uh, local leaders for the uh women's movement and for uh fair she was the uh, the person who created the fair housing fair housing yeah. Uh, in that this area, she was the chairman for it. She started it, and nice. she started it with black women and Native American women. And my mom, my mom was like the white one white woman yeah. at first. So, okay. so you know, when we talk about this little pinnacle of the, you know, like the power hungry, I mean, I'm just going to call it here. Most of them are Republican white men in senate right now if you're looking for who it is that is oppressing everyone that's not yeah, all of it but that's a perfect like that's what you want to look for that's what you're going to find mm -hmm. they know if they separate us out you know divide and conquer but we all of us who have been oppressed know that if you know united we stand divided we fall they're trying to divide us if we all of us stand together and say Black Lives Matter, we know that that statement will come back to each of us in a positive way. Yeah, and I, I do want to, I know I keep coming back to this because I just don't feel like I've uh, thoroughly covered it. Maybe I have, but there were articles that I've read um, with the um, Indigenous People Matter and First Nations. So, across, you know, Canada and, you know, this country and in other countries where they have explicitly over the last several years since 2015 since black lives matter movement really took off um those particular groups of folks in those countries have also used the black lives matter moniker and have said explicitly we recognize this doesn't say that we don't you know doesn't it doesn't indicate why that we don't matter in fact we understand our history together and we fully support and when saying Black Lives Matter, it also says that we matter. So I want to make that clear because, again, I just, I, I guess I have an issue. I'm not denying because every human being in every group matters. Again, I am also echoing for the umpteenth time in a similar and different way that the Black Lives Matter movement means that everybody matters but until you recognize the historical oppression of at least black people in this country and i say in this country because the black lives matter movement was started here mm -hmm. about black americans but it doesn't deny the indigenous impression oppression in this country because there are so many native people who have been killed who right. have been kidnapped raped murdered right whether they are cisgendered or part of the two-spirit community or transgendered in the indigenous communities as well. But the Black Lives Matter movement supports that struggle as well, mm -hmm. right? In First Nations, in Canada, the Aboriginal people in um, New Zealand, Australia, and any other place, and as well as the Black British folk that was, and that's the other thing I don't think we mentioned with um, uh, Rennie Edo Lodge's book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, that she's British and she's Black. And so the same things that we experience here, they experience in Britain. They didn't know much about their history either because it was conveniently not, um, uh, they, it wasn't taught 
through their history. They started with this whole slavery thing, just like here, right? But slavery was abolished there at least 30 years before it was abolished here. And the British folk aren't necessarily more knowledgeable about their history. She happened to question it. How did we get here? And so through her book, she really talks, and she's a journalist, a well-respected journalist in um, London. She really talks about that experience and that the same conversations, Benita, that we've been having, that you, know, you, you, you label part of it as white currency and why she said, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. It actually led to this, this book because she wrote a blog post and she has gotten the same, what we call white fragility and white privilege responses to negate her conversations about how what racism and oppression look like from her lens as a black person in Britain when all they can see as white Brits is what are you talking about we treat everybody fair we don't we don't see color that colorblind rhetoric all the while what they're doing and in saying that is very oppressive and so she also covers feminism um, and she says very explicitly that when you know the, the the worth of black feminists black feminists are the true feminists because feminist in its purest form is about supporting all people who have been oppressed but when you have when you start talking as a group of just white women about feminism but you are then making it a binary it's against men you're not a feminist you're a racist mm -hmm. you are uplifting and supporting the ideals of white women in this male power structure. You're not thinking about the needs of your fellow human beings, which is what every single black feminist that we can point to talks about. You know, people point to Audre Lorde, to Bell Hooks, um, to other feminists that I'm sure I'm leaving out. And then males can be feminists too. Doesn't mean you're feminine. Feminism as a concept means that you are fighting for the rights for human equity for all people is what it is. And when one group wins, other groups win in terms of their human worth. You know, it's as my mother taught me when I was young, feminism equals humanism. Exactly. Yeah. But you don't call yourself a humanist because that means that, you know, that humanism is the goal. Feminism is about women and the feminine energy and the divine feminine energy and equality to become a level playing field, then we can all be humanists. But so long as it's uneven, we got to call ourselves feminists to say, let's get us so, all together. That's right. the same. Then, right, but then I'll challenge that because I think that is also a matter of the lens and the perspective because of my life walk, because of how I have incarnated in the time. When I hear that, I'm hearing white women. Because as at, when you look it at- It was not said as that. It, said, it wasn't, but let, me, but let me explain to you how, and I'm sure I'm not alone, how I process that because I don't have the luxury of just thinking from a, a, a female perspective. I have blackness, brownness, indigenous, femaleness to contend with, and I'm short, so the heightness, you know, that matters. It and does. Real thing, people make assumptions, right? So mm -hmm. I have to consider all of the, all parts of intersectionality with that. I can't just say women. So if you go back, I watched the Miss America, Mrs. America thing, which was phenomenal. Um, and you think about it from a Phyllis Schlafly type of position, she's talking about white women, mm -hmm. certain, certain standard. Right. That's not my reality. The other thing, though, that, um, oh, so to finish that, so that when I bring all of that to bear, that's when my humanity is seen. It's just one element. It's all of who I am and all of what I represent, even my spiritual beliefs. It's, it's all of that, right? Um, right. And if you're a feminist and you really believe you're a feminist, that means you're not afraid to challenge racism. You don't right. fall into white fragility. You don't default into um, homophobia. You don't default right. into saying my trans uh, people are not worthy because they are. You right. don't 
default to all of those different tropes, right? Mm -hmm. Make yourself feel better. You embrace and say, you know what? I may not have lived your experience, but I support your struggle mm -hmm. and be an ally to your struggle. And to me, that is part of what the Black Lives Matter movement represents. When we see worldwide that the embodiment of the people who are, who are in the struggle with us represent all different types of hues, ethnic groups, religious beliefs, um, expressions of gender, doesn't matter. And that shows me that this is a feminist, humanist movement in the true sense. Yes. Yeah, that's what, I mean, that's actually where I was I trying know, to get to. You know, I have to, I have that, to double that like, the double advocate. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you for myself, as a woman who made the unfortunate mistake of being brilliant in my field as a chef, mm -hmm. so I had to be squelched constantly by men because how dare I be more brilliant than them? I can tell you the feminism within me got kicked in the gut again and again and again as men kept taking credit for my work and taking my promotions or I can't tell you how often I lost a job because a program I created that set literally global reset global standard for my for the field I was in the credit was given to a man and I was removed from position. This happened to me multiple times, which is why I set up my own consulting business because just mm -hmm. because of that. However, as a feminist, since my goal is for all humanity to be equal and caring about each other and no one to be looked upon as you're different, so therefore I'm threatened by you, all of us to be equal. As a feminist right now, my focus is on Black Lives Matter because you always have to look on who needs help to level the playing, playing field. And right now we have the chance to raise the Black Lives Matter, release all color concepts to anything other than how beautiful we all look the way we are. You know, there's always going to be someone who at the moment needs a helping hand to get up. Yeah. And I think to call myself a feminist right now, my focus is not on women, it's on Black Lives Matter, but by in, you know, and as an advocate for special needs youth and the constant false imprisonment and abuse in our country, especially in Virginia, the worst offender in our nation of special needs youth, we put our focus on Black Lives Matter because what's the number one group falsely arrested? Black special needs youth. So, and right behind that, brown special needs youth. So when we all come together and say Black Lives Matter and get everyone to do that, immediately it lightens up the energy on feminism, on false arrest and mistreatment of special needs youth, because the biggest area there is now, you know, aerated. We're all coming together and right. then we can filter out to our details. Right. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. language is important. Language is important. And so that's the other piece, you know, to bring to the conversation. Um, and this is also why it's it's important to have dialogue so that we can yeah. all readjust. You know, I think part of the problem is, is that historically people in general don't necessarily listen or hear one another. <laughs> we approach things you know, from our worldview, from our perceptions. We don't wanna ask questions. We don't wanna engage um, to really understand that for most people, you have things in common. Mm -hmm. And to work towards getting to that place, that is really the place where we need to have a starting place, you know? Um, Far too many people want to delve into what they perceive as being different instead of how they're united. So, I mean, that's the other thing that, um, well, she didn't say it in that way. I, I said this, she didn't say this at all. But one of the things that Rennie um, Edo Lodge pointed to with the whole feminist comment was that feminism 
is not a one concept umbrella or theory and that there's not just one man. All white men are not the same. All black men are not the same. People who are categorized as white or categorized as black, all white women, all black women, all indigenous women, we're not the same. And people are not the same. I mean, we have the same needs in terms of the basic needs, you know, of, of food, health, care, clothing, all of that. But our experiences, our positionality in the world is not necessarily the same, right? Mm -hmm. But like you said, going back to, oh, and so feminism recognizes that, right? Um, oh, yeah. I mean, to, to me, it does. To me, it does. It actually horrified me when you had the response of feminism and you said white women, because I never saw feminism that way. So you've now opened my eyes. Right. Like, I need to do some deep dive and some thinking because it terrifies me that I might speak about the empowerment of feminism as an all inclusive concept. And people would hear it as inclusive for white people only. I'm like, I need to learn how to expand my vocabulary so I can right. present in a way that it's accepted. And so I know you, and I know that that's not where you were going, but I had to say it for the, you know, a plus, even if it were just you and I talking, I would have introduced Yeah, No, I appreciate that because you're giving me an opportunity to know when I speak, I need to really like, I'm not always speaking the same language as the people who are hearing me, even if we're having the same conversation. Right. And this goes to, um, th this goes to something that I have said. I, so I belong to a, um, a lovely book. I love my book club. I'm so protective of my book club. And it's called, I'm giving y'all a shout out, Diverse Discourses. And we are a combination of um, diverse and inclusive individuals on every single spectrum you could think of there's representatives of such. And we, we read um, books that are provocative, that cater to diversity, sometimes topics we, we're like, people wanna shy away from, but we, we're in it. All of that to say, I had um, initially, you know, when you're trying to figure out the people you're working with, now we've been in existence for, oh my God, almost three years now, it's, it's amazing. Um, but initially there was one woman who was white very strong-willed and opinionated, very bright, uh, and then me, <laughs> the two of us. And we would, we would butt heads quite frequently. Part of it was because of listening. Like I heard her. I, she's white. I've heard everything that she said. She didn't think I heard her until we had this very intimate moment at a smaller gathering where she challenged, like, you, you know, you want me to hear you? You don't. I said, no, I hear you. So I went through this whole process. I said, look, I have to think. If I say this, how is she going to how is this going to be perceived? If I say if I don't say it, if I say it this way, how's it? Oh my God, that sounds exhausting. Day, it is. Every engagement, are they going to perceive it this way? Gonna, I have to do that. So therefore, I'm listening carefully, not just with what you say, how you say it, what's not said, how it's interpreted. I have to go through this constantly. She didn't have to do that. Now, I will say as a white woman, woman doesn't mean that her life has been uh, problem free. It hasn't because I've gotten to know her, her and her mom. And her mom is a, they'll know if they hear this and watch this, fight the, fight the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. They also have white currency. And it was in that moment to say, look, no, I hear you, but understand that I have to hear you through this. And I have to filter everything that I say through this through understanding white supremacy at a whole different level. And once we realize that most of the time she and I are saying the same thing. So we can uh -huh. see it as challenging in a book club meeting. She can say one thing, I can look at her and be like, oh, I got you. I understand what you're saying. So we developed that, but it was in hearing. So language matters and not necessarily assuming because the thing is in this country and in most of the world, the assumptions about everything come from a, a white positionality, mm -hmm. from a class of whiteness, but from a white positionality. Even talking about television shows, if you're in a group 
that is considered a mixed group and they throw out some mainstream white television show, the assumption is everybody knows what the hell you're talking about or some song. That's not true. But that goes from that that comes from this assumption of we matter and I don't think about it because it's the whole whiteness is just like a fish to water. It's the norm. Hell, it really isn't, but you've made it that way. Mm -hmm. This is why language matters, but also hearing other people's experiences in their positionality and why black folk in this country should have healthy paranoia against the police and sadly against whiteness because it has not historically been kind. Right. And so, you know, until you sit, you meaning the collective you and people are not, don't come from positions of feeling threatened and you're feeling threatened over what? If you don't even know why you're feeling threatened or is something something superficial, or they look like they may cause me harm, you really got a problem. There is some type of illness, mental illness going on that is whiteness, if that is your first go-to. Mm. Don't question it, there's something wrong with you, not wrong with the rest of us who question it. And so now we're at a moment of time where there are, there are many people questioning this, and this is healthy. This is to me, this country and this land purging itself, you know, because nothing can heal if it doesn't get air. That's yep. common sense. You, you cut yourself at some point, we cover it, but at some point we need air for it to continue to heal and you need to get all of the oozing out. And this country has never had that moment of reconciliation and it's going to take a long time, even across the world. It's going to take a long time but we got to be committed to it. Yeah, well, the time is now. Yeah, but we got to We can't stop, though. We can't just say, yeah. I'm not done. We have to commit. Yeah, yeah we, we got to keep going forward. There's, there's yeah. if, and, and we're running out of time, so I don't want to start a yeah. whole thing, but I do want to say the way the planet was functioning was not working. We're literally killing our planet. We're killing each other. We've yeah. got to find a way forward. And it begins with recognizing everyone is a human being. So it begins with Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. If we do not honor the Black Lives Matter movement, then I mean, I don't know what's in the future for humanity. I really don't because we got to start, we got to start here. It's what we have in front of us and it's what people are reacting to. People are, you know, coming together and people are coming together because it's meaningful. So, yeah. you know, we got to go forward with this. Yeah. And, and, and the only thing I wanted to just add was um, that the, the, again, because mainstream is recognizing it, which is great. So I'm not going to, yeah. you know, ally as an ally, but the movement has been going on since um, Indian removal, since, uh -huh. Columbus set foot on this land. It's been happening ever since. And on right. other lands and in other countries, in the Caribbean, in you know, the UK, everywhere in Scotland, because slavery and oppression have happened and, and it hit everywhere. We just don't know about it because poor America is so insulated because of the privilege that it has bestowed upon itself historically. Yes that we don't even want to take the time to see how other people in other countries who are oppressed have been affected. And then also the solidarity with the alliance, you know, the allies. So we need to step outside of our, our, our blinders. And, and I think that is also what the Black Lives Matter movement has done, it, it, along with, of course, the social media and the pandemic. It's allowed us to step outside of this cocoon that resembles the plight of other people. Mm -hmm. We absolutely have strength in numbers and that our allies, white or otherwise, or even, even people who, again, are non-white but are at the upper echelons financially, those who are stepping in to support, you know, this is the time we needed you guys. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. If you look back in history, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, and you look at the extraordinary civilizations and societies in the African continent. Mm -hmm. And you look at the 
barbarians who came from the north to try to destroy that and oppress us, oppress it. Like what you are saying is true. You know, the Black Lives Matter movement has been going on for a long time and the oppression's been going on for a long time, but now is where we're at. And now is the time for us to say, we got to change it. We got to honor all of humanity and it begins with this, mm -hmm. you know, we, we got to. I mean, we cannot, we cannot be healthy. Well, it's like saying I'm going to be a healthy person, but I'll repeatedly stab myself in my thigh, you know, with a knife. Like, mm -hmm. we cannot go forward unless we. You have to take care of the whole body, and the Black Lives Matter movement is representative of the whole body. Yeah. And if you injure one part of that body, you're not going to thrive. Not even close. Yeah. Not even close. And, you know, Dr. Darrell, I want to thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, my God. I could talk to you for hours and hours. And As hours. we have done. <laughs> Not all the time, right? Yeah. And um, you guys watching, if you have any issues you want us to talk about or anyone that you think we should talk with, you're welcome to let us know because, uh, as you can see, Dr. Daryl and I love to talk. And I, I mean, oh my God, just listen, every time you and I talk, my brain becomes bigger and smarter just by having a short conversation with you. So I thank you. Do that. I'm just being me. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. And um, we'll catch you another time soon, most likely. All righty, take care.